Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to today's uh, presentation by uh, Jerry Shannon. Uh, you're very welcome, Jerry. Uh, Jerry is a historian and he graduated from DCU, where uh, I also graduated. So um, that's really good to know. Um, so uh, he is um, going to give us a talk today on uh, Sean Russell. Uh, most most of us who are from the local area will simply know him as the the man of the stat with the statue of the hat and the hat in the park. Uh, so uh, Jerry will be talking to us about who this man was, um, and uh, the talk is called a, a successor to Tone and Casement: The Life of Sean Russell, IRA Chief of Staff. Um, he's uh, Jared is also writing a book uh, which is due to be published next year on Liam Lynch. Uh, by Marion Press, so uh, we for that. Um, so before we start, I'd just ask people if they could uh, uh, make sure that they are on mute. Hugo, you're in twice there, and one of them is making sounds. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so if you could just put yourself on mute, uh, that would be great. Um, and just before we start, um, I'd like to just mention that uh, uh, a number of um, events that are happening in, in recent weeks. So uh, the East World History Group will be doing a walking tour on um, the War of Independence. If you would like to join that, please email us. And also the East World History Group will be doing a presentation during the Dublin History Festival um, on um, the uh, Dockland involvement in the Spanish Civil War, and I think Jerry, you have a part to play in that as well. So uh, I'm going to hand over to you now. Okay. So uh, thanks very much, Katrina, and it's a pleasure to be speaking for the East Royal History Group today. And hello to all the attendants. Look forward to the questions and discussions later on. So as mentioned, my talk today will be looking at the life of Sean Russell, who became the IRA Chief of Staff in 1939. From 1916 until his death in August 1940, Russell devoted nearly his entire adult life to the cause of militant Irish republicanism and was a major figure in the IRA during the revolutionary period and beyond. The current statue in Fairview Park of Russell continues to be a major site of pilgrimage for Republican commemoration and a flashpoint for political controversy. The reference, or rather the question that I pose in my title, comes from a quote in a profile of Russell in a 1951 edition of the Republican periodical, The United Irishman, which proclaimed Russell as nothing less than, quote, a worthy successor to Tony Casement. So in mid 2020, as protests in support of Black Lives Matter swept through much of the Western world, and these same countries' major debate played out in the public and media spheres over controversial statues in public spaces. In Ireland, one such debate involved the statue of Sean Russell in Fairview Park, as well as a typically lively debate on RT's Liveline. The most notable intervention was then Taoiseach Leo Bradker even publicly calling for the statue's removal, as you can see here. But controversy over a statue of Russell is nothing new. As we can see, the initial statue put up in 1951, you can see in the top right-hand corner there, had through the decades seen arms and hands removed and even been decapitated. The most recent version of the statue put up in 2009 to replace the damaged original has also been the focus of vandalized attacks, as we can see here. And the original statue actually has a very interesting fate, which I'll reveal at the end of the talk. But the main controversy over Sean Russell relates to his clandestine travels to Berlin in 1940, to meet the representatives of the Nazi government in order to secure arms to the IRA, of which he was then chief of staff. This episode near the end of Russell's life is important, but it does not help us to understand who he was, or indeed why Irish Republicans in the 1950s felt him above many others was then deserving of a statue. Was he truly, as others allege, a Nazi sympathizer? Is it right to call him even a Nazi collaborator? What made him to admirers, again, in the view of the article in 1951, a, quote, worthy successor to Tony Casement? And there, as I found in my ongoing research into his life, considerable challenges and obstacles to anyone who wishes to explore him. There is no personal Sean Russell archive in any of the existing institutions or collections. Russell left no memoirs or planning tracks to explain his ideology or the reasoning behind any of his decisions. 
though a veteran of the earlier 1916 to 23 periods, given he did not recognize the Irish Free State, he did not give a witness statement to the Bureau of Military History or apply for a military pension, which would help contextualize some of his actions from the decade that encompasses the revolutionary period. Though it's worth saying of interest that Russell himself was actually a referee for certain applicants for the state military pension. So as much as we can determine from the existing material that we do have access to, such as articles or accounts by others, who was Sean Russell? Now, both birth and census records help us to pin down the basic details of his early life. Russell was born John Russell on the 13th of October, 1893 at, at 41 Lower Buckingham Street in inner city Dublin. He was the youngest among three sons and four daughters of his father, James, a clerk, and his mother, Mary. A relative of Russell's has indicated to me, Sean may have been radicalized due to growing up in the poor conditions of the tenements during his formative years. The 1911 census identifies Russell at age 17 working as a draper's assistant. By then the Russell family was residing at 76 North Strand in the Mount Joy area of Dublin. Later newspaper articles and state records during the years of Sean's IRA activities would place his own residence at 68 North Strand. The one police, at least one police report places his residence at 66A North Strand. So if anyone has any clarity on where exactly his address was, I would appreciate it. And I know some of the confusion may be due to, you know, other members of the Russell family residing in the area. Now, a series of articles in Sean Russell's life published in 1951 for the English tabloid Reynolds News and written by the IRA veteran Dermot Brennan does much to illuminate key details of Russell's life. Brennan makes mention of Russell attending the Christian Brothers School on North Richmond Street. Sean apparently told his father, James, he wished to join the Sisterson's Monastery of Mount Melloray at the base of the Knockfield Down Mountains. James Russell was apparently reluctant for his son to adopt such a nomadic lifestyle. Hence, later, Sean becoming a draper's assistant at a shop on North Earl Street, actually his first employment. Sean, however, became unsatisfied in the job and left it to become a shop fitter. Dermot Brennan writes this job allowed Russell to get a feel for tools and handling machinery, skills he would later put to good use as IRA director of munitions. Swept up in the tide of nationalist fervor, typical of those of his age in the period, and this is likely when he first started going by Sean, Russell joined the volunteers in 1914 and went with the Al McNeil led faction on the split from the Redmondite National Volunteers. The Bureau of Military History witness statement of Liam Daly is in fact an entire biography of Russell in the years from the rise into the Civil War. Daly's affection throughout the witness statement is striking, and he sums Russell up as, quote, the only Irishman that was incorruptible, and may his memory be such as to induce his virtue in Irishmen to come. That's a, actually an extract from it there on the left. Russell was a member of his local E Company of the 2nd Battalion of the Dublin Brigade of the Irish Volunteers, much of the area of the 2nd Battalion, of course, north of O'Connell Street. Daly recalled first meeting Sean Russell in January 1916, then already the section commander of E Company. Daly was struck by, quote, how even at this early stage, and without any military training, he infused a high standard of efficiency in this small group. Already at this early juncture in his revolutionary activities, Sean Russell was proving to be a natural leader. Nor was Russell to be found wanting in actual combat. At the outset of the fighting during the insurrection of Easter week, 1916, Russell, on the instructions of the E Company Captain Thomas Weaver, built a barricade consisting of sacks of flour in North Strand. British troops arriving across Ansley, Ansley Bridge and attempt to go down East Road, engage with Russell and those under his command and were forced to retreat. Russell and those in North Strand then received instructions to move to the terrace on O'Connell Street. When Weaver was killed during the fighting, Russell was appointed second in command to Oscar Trainer. The group of rebels instructed by James Connolly then took over the Metropole Hotel. And Trainer later wrote in 1927 an account of Russell during this time and how the group during Easter week began to dig holes to navigate through the block on O'Connell Street. By Friday of Easter week, with the Metropole Hotel engulfed in flames, Russell delivered to Trainer a message for the group to evacuate the block. And after some confusion over the course of several hours, Trainer led his men to follow the rest of the GPO garrison into the Moore Street Terrace. Trainer later said of Russell, during the terrible experience for the citizen soldiers of the intensive shelling and eventual burning out of our position, he was an inspiration to all. And worth noting at the time he wrote that in 1927, Trainer was an elected Fianna Fáil TD. 
Being daily noted in From Gok that Russell tended to keep aloof from his fellow prisoners, only associating with those whom he fought in Easter week. Like most internees, Russell was released by Christmas 1916. On his return to Ireland, Russell rejoined at the reformed E Company of the 2nd Battalion. Dick McKee, head of the Dublin Brigade, later appointed as captain, quote, by Liam Daly, the unanimous choice of E Company, the quiet, unassuming, but efficient section commander, Sean Russell. Now, Daly claimed from, quote, that day on, the morale and efficiency of E Company became a byword, not only in the Dublin Brigade, but also IRA GHQ. Such was Sean Russell's dedication to E Company, he ensured regular training, drill, and maneuvers, that this, of course, ensured his late promotion to both OC of the 2nd Battalion in 1920, and later Director of Munitions for IRA GHQ. Daly recalled that how, despite his late promotions, Russell still kept a, quote, fatherly eye on his old E Company throughout mili the later military conflict. We get to the War of Independence at the outset in March 1920, sorry, in March 1919. Daly proposed Russell for membership of his own circle of the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. On returning from that meeting in which Russell was sworn in, Daly wrote, he was struck by how much of a momentous decision the occasion seemed to be for Russell on his admission to the IRB. He recalled how Russell, quote, spoke in a quiet tone, but a Christmas and a brevity of words that was part of him. He said, Liam, were it not for Easter week, I'd be in a monastery. And this, of course, a reference to his earlier ambitions. In May 1920, Russell succeeded Frank Henderson as commander of the 2nd Battalion Dublin Brigade, a position he held until the following November. Russell, at that time, was given a central role in the planning of the IRA operation on Bloody Sunday, or what became known as Bloody Sunday, rather, on the 21st of November 1920, which, as we know, dozens of British agents identified by IRA intelligence were to be assassinated in various locations around the city that morning. The task assigned to Russell was to select the units of IRA men to carry out the execution of the alleged British agents, 12 operations in all. Five of these operations included men from Russell's own 2nd Battalion, joined by members of Michael Collins' squad and IRA GHQ intelligence on specific operations. The units at each location would include men who would enter the target's house and carry out the shooting, those in holding positions providing security outside, and members of Cumann and Mann who were also in place nearby to clandestinely remove weapons and ammunition after the, after the jobs were done. Russell appointed Patrick Moran, captain of D Company 2nd Battalion, to target three secret servicemen staying at the Gresham Hotel on Sackville Street. But elsewhere, he insisted on appointing members of the squad, more experienced assassins, to head the units carrying out the other operations. Harry Colley of the 2nd Battalion recalled Russell addressing the men taking part in the operations on the previous night in Terra Hall in Gloucester Street, as we now know as Sean McDermott Street. Russell reminded those present that, quote, it was vitally necessary for the success of our fight that they, quote, the spies be removed, that no country had scruples about shooting enemy spies in wartime, that if any man had moral scruples about going on this operation, he was at full liberty to withdraw, and no one would think the worse of him. But he wanted every man to be satisfied in his conscience that he could properly take part in this operation. The IRA units involved with submit after action supports were then to be reviewed by Russell. In the week prior to November, the 21st of November, Russell also secured the family home on 17 North Richmond Street of Catherine Byrne, a member of Cumnamon, in order to function as a first aid station if any of the men of the operations were injured. Russell would also personally ensure the same residence function as a safe house for Frank Teeling, following his dramatic escape from Kermain in jail in February 1921. As it was, 14 British officers were killed in the morning shootings and five more wounded. That afternoon, through a police informant, a, D a DMP sergeant, Tom Kilcoyne, the OC of B Company, informed both Sean Russell and Harry Colley of the possibility of the auxiliaries carrying out reprisals on the crowd at, at the Dublin Temporary Gaelic Football Game in Crow Park. At the Joneses Road entrance to Crow Park, just prior to the match proceeding, Russell argued at length with GAA officials to prevent further members of the public gaining admittance and evacuate those that had already assembled in the stands. But of course, the match began and all three members of the IRA were dismissed by the Crow Park officials into part of the area. Of course, we all know what followed with British forces opening fire on the crowd there in Crow Park on that day, killing 14. 
Later that afternoon, Oscar Trainer, Vice Brigadier of the Dublin Brigade, recalled Michael Collins instructing him and Russell to assemble the best men of the 2nd Battalion to attempt a rescue of Commandant and Vice Commander, respectively, of the IRA Dublin Brigade, Dick McKee and Paddock Clancy, who'd been arrested the night before from the Bridewell. Collins had requested Trainer to meet him at 46 Parnell Square. Collins' intelligence was faulty, however. McKee was instead taken to McKee and Clancy were instead taken to Dublin Castle, and Trainer, Russell, and Collins himself actually avoided an hour escape from the authorities who swooped in 46 Parnell Square. McKee and Clancy, along with his civilian Connor Clune, were shot dead by the auxiliaries in Dublin Castle that evening. It was actually following Bloody Sunday that Michael Collins appointed Russell as Director of Munitions on IRA GHQ, a sign perhaps that Russell's planning had impressed the Director of IRA Intelligence. This appointment came at great protest to Collins from Oscar Trainer, who had now assumed command of the Dublin Brigade and wished for Russell to be his second in command. Thomas Young and the IRA munitions staff was to claim Russell's appointment did not have the approval of him or others involved in munitions. Young felt, quote, Russell had no engineering ability, but considered himself by virtue of his appointments to be in a position to instruct and direct all munition workers. However, in the opinion of Oscar Trainer, Russell was a tremendously keen volunteer and had an extraordinary bent for organizing and establishing matters of this kind. Trainer recalled Russell's innovation in establishing and overseeing munitions factories throughout Dublin City. Each of these factories seemed to serve a different purpose. The casting of grenades or the brass work and the finishing of the grenade shell. And finally, the insertion of the explosive material and the detonator. The finished grenades were passed to the quartermaster's department, which then issued them to the volunteers. Russell feared the possibility of all the work being lost in one enemy raid, which explained the widespread of the various factories throughout the city. The main munitions factory was at 198 Great Britain Street, we of course now know as Parnell Street. Other areas involved Crown Alley, Luke Street and Peter Street. To Trainer, there were great improvements now in the type of grenade issued to volunteers courtesy of Russell, that quote, the old complaint from which volunteers suffered previously, that of trying a grenade and not seeing it explode, was almost eliminated. This in turn allowed for quote, a greater confidence in the fighting men of the various units. Russell similarly improved on the production of landmines, distributing the plans to various IRA divisions across the country. The biographical articles, which were written by Dermot Brennan in 1951, allege Russell was central to the planning of the burning of the Custom House by the IRA on the 25th of May, 1921. Brennan wrote, and I quote, Russell injected a fiery enthusiasm into the guerrilla war throughout the spring of 1921. In May, he hardly slept a wink with Oscar Trainer and Tom Ennis, he was up night and day planning the burning of the Custom House, the mainspring of the British Civil Administration. While Russell is not normally recalled as a key figure in accounts of the planning of the attack, given his position as IRA Director of Munitions and his, pre, and his, his, his frequent close association with the Dublin Brigade 2nd Battalion, it is likely he was involved to a considerable degree. Brendan seems to even imply Russell was there on the day, saying, Sean's old comrades from the 2nd Battalion were out in force when the building went up in flames. The cream of the brigade was captured on the operation, but Russell was never caught. Remarkably, Russell even wrote an account of the attack of, of the Custom House for the 1936 Wolftown Annual, an extract of which can actually be seen here in the bottom right-hand corner. While he doesn't detail his own involvement on the day, Russell gives much of the article to paying tribute to IRA volunteer Ned Dorans, a Ned, sorry, Ned Dorans, a member of the 2nd Battalion E Company, who Russell likely knew very well. Russell writes Doran's quote, selflessness, patriotism and heroism should be an example and an inspiration. As a result of his position on IRA GHQ, Russell was one of 13 individuals depicted in artist Leah Whelan's painting of the IRA leadership by the time of the truce. The artist Whelan wanted to take advantage of the opportunity of these men now being, being able to appear in public. The painting today hangs in the National Museum of Ireland, Collins' barracks near the Soldiers and Chiefs exhibition. In the painting, Russell is seated second from the right between Owen O'Duffy and Sean McMahon. Well, and you can see a, there's a bigger version of that online, and it's actually a brilliant uh, article about it in uh, History Ireland. Whelan completed the painting in late 1922 or early 1923, by which time many of those depicted together were now opposed to each other in the Irish Civil War, in the case of those such as Michael Collins and Lee Mellows, dead. Of the Civil War itself, well, following the signing of the anglo Wires Treaty in December 1921, Russell was one of only four members of IRA GHQ opposed to the settlement 
along with Rory O'Connor as Director of Engineering, Seamus O'Donovan as Director of Chemicals, and Lee Mellows as Director of Purchases. In January 1922, at an office in Marlborough Street, Rory O'Connor got at a group of the IRA leaders opposed to the treaty, at which Russell was present. Russell was recalled by Ernie O'Malley at this first meeting as central to the drafting of a statement by the anti-treaty anti -treaty IRA officers to Richard Mulcahy, then the IRA chief of staff, which demanded the holding of an IRA convention that March. O'Malley, in his uh, memoir, The Singing Flame, vividly noted how at this first meeting, Russell, quote, twisted and untwisted his hands as he spoke, the fingers pressing on the knuckles of the other hand. He threw himself forward when he stood up, the lapels of his coat went further back and his body turned to one side. His even teeth showed when he talked. His kindly ready smile betrayed no trace of his debt dealing work. And let me say about O'Malley, he was a great writer. Russell, not surprisingly, again, assumed the position of director of munitions on the new anti-treaty IRA executive following the convention's rejection of the authority of Dal Aaron that March. This is indicative of the respect held for his work in this role during the 1919 to 21 period. Following the seizure of the four courts by the IRA executive in April 1922, Russell joined the anti-treaty garrison based in the building. As the attack on the four courts began on the 28th of June 1922, Russell had in fact been visiting an uncle who lived in dry certain County Westmead. Captured by members of the National Army as he tried to get back to Dublin, Russell was held in Ballymahon Workhouse. His brother Pat Russell was even arrested there when he attempted to visit his younger brother. With the aid of a friend who was one of the guards at the site, Russell, his brother Pat, and two others managed to escape. Reaching Mullingar, Sean Russell made it back to Dublin by train eventually and re-established contact with what was what left of the IRA leadership after the capture of leading figures during the Battle of Dublin. <clears throat> Ernie O'Malley, now over the IRA's Eastern Command, was delighted to report to the IRA Chief of Staff, Liam Lynch, of Russell's return, saying, he is a godsend, and I expect that we shall have some return from this branch. Subsequently, Russell was to resume his role of attempting to run bomb making factories in Dublin, along with Seamus O'Donovan, Director of Chemicals, who you'd very still would have a very close association in later years. Recalling an inspection of the Dublin munition centres in this period, Joe Connor conveyed, quote, the highest praise to Sean Russell for his energy in overcoming great difficulties and for the quality and number of grenades he produced. If only half his energy and his enthusiasm had been shown by other officers, the Republican armies the Republican army might still have won the war. Whatever his limited resources, Ernie O'Malley re nonetheless recognized Russell's value and appointed him as adjutant general for the IRA's Eastern Command. As a result, Russell, within Dublin, like the rest of O'Malley and his staff, was frequently on the move throughout the capital. Following the arrest of Lee Mellows in July 1922, Russell also took over his duty as director of purchases. As a result, Una Daly, a secretary to Mellows, now worked for Russell in a similar capacity. In her own witness statement, she wrote, Sean like Liam was an idealist. He never took a penny for his work. Una Daly also recalled Russell's tendency for disguise as he moved to the city, with his hair dyed and carrying a pipe, which ensured he could have made a rest for a time. Russell, according to Daly, was, quote, a good living fellow, a known smoker and a known drinker. Moss Toomey later amusingly claimed that a police sergeant advised him to tell Russell to desist with his tendency for this particular disguise as the police sergeant felt it did not suit him. Something of the persistent difficulties for Russell in this period can be seen in a communication to O'Malley in late October 1922. Here Russell refers to a raid on a premises in Gardner Street, which, quote, as a result, three of the munition staff were arrested and a machinery taken away. Russell assured O'Malley that although, quote, the loss of the shop and staff is a great shock to the department. We can still carry on. And I think that gives a great sense of his difficulties during this period in contrast to the previous town war period. Not to say it wasn't difficult back then either. On November the 23rd, 1922, Russell was arrested at a safe house in Clontar in a prison in Mountjoy Jail. His arrest was announced in an official press release from the National Army GHQ the following day. He was to remain a prisoner of the Irish Free State until well after the conflict ended in May 1923 with the dump arms order by the anti-treaty IRA chief of staff, Frank Aiken. Liam Daly, who earlier I quoted from his witness statement, was now a National Army engineer officer at the Curra, recalled his last sad encounter at Russell when the latter was a prisoner there following his spell of Mount Joy. Daly noted as he walked by him that when Russell saw me, he looked through me. I was in a way his warder. And it's interesting he says that's his last encounter with Russell 
Yet he still writes a lengthy witness statement about him 30 years later, speaking of his admiration for him. Very, I think very striking. For hundreds of Republicans, the conflict was to continue in the free state jails, with hunger strikes and protests at their continued imprisonments. And I think, personally, I think this is very much a bit of a, not for Republicans, but maybe generally for people, it's a bit of a forgotten period after the Civil War, the, the prison conflicts. By the time the hunger, the hunger strike and the, the prison protests were abandoned, with three anti-treaty IRA volunteers dead, Russell himself endured 41 days on hunger strike and survived. Russell was among the last group of anti-treaty IRA officers released from the Curra on the 17th of July, 1924. In his memoir, The Singing Flame, Ernie O'Malley recalled he and Russell being released and boarding a train at Kildare Station with other senior IRA officers. Arriving in Kinsbridge, O'Malley recalled the group parting ways to, quote, take up the treads of inscrutable destiny, some to begin life all over again. The end of the 1920s, the, the 1920s were to see Russell central to the convulsions engulfing the IRA in a dramatically changed political climate across the island. From 1924 onward, much debate and discussion in the wider Republican movement centered on the political direction for Republicanism following the defeat in the Civil War. This most dramatically resulted in Eamon de Valera founding the Fianna Fáil party in 1926, following the departure of many anti-treaty Republicans from Sinn Féin, espousing a new form of constitutional Republicanism. The dwindling IRA, nonetheless, were to maintain an association with Fianna Fáil throughout much of the decade, even into the later years of the latter assuming power in the Irish Free State from 1932. But this was to prove a turbulent and not entirely comfortable or even over overly close relationship. The chief of staff of the IRA from 1927 to 36 was Morris Moss Toomey. Toomey, a Republican veteran like Russell, was to be a tireless, indispensable organiser and a well-liked leader of the IRA in this period. And I'm actually always struck there's no memorial to Moss Toomey, despite his uh, service for the Republican cause. It was nonetheless an unenviable role for Toomey, as the IRA faced diminished military prospects, a dwindling membership, not to mention repression and imprisonment by both the Northern and Free State Security Forces. Russell himself was put on trial in 1925, following a raid in his residence in North Strand by the authorities and the discovery of important IRA documents. He subsequently took part in a dramatic escape from Mount Joy Jail along with other imprisoned IRA leaders. And uh, the historian Donald Fallon has actually recently done a brilliant podcast on this, well, well worth listening to the, the escape from Mount Joy Jail in the 20s. The escape had formed part of a charge, a criminal charge that was resulted in a brief return to prison for Russell in 1927. A now worthy, if unsuccessful, venture for Russell on behalf of the IRA was traveling to the Soviet Union in 1925 in an attempt to secure arms to the Soviets. Traveling in Russell was, were fellow IRA leaders Gerald Boland and Pa Murray. The latter even had an audience with Stalin himself. And there's actually a brilliant article on this in History Ireland, well worth listening to, that details the strange association that the IRA saw to the Soviet Union in the 20s. From 1927 to 36, Sean Russell, holding the rank of Commander General, would take on the position of Quartermaster General on Toomey's IRA staff. In this role, Russell was expected to be responsible for the supply and distribution of arms, equipment, and ammunition to IRA units. Toomey and the Senator Chief of Staff felt it was important to keep a firm hand on such a strong personality as Russell. However, as the subsequent decade was approved, the deeply militant and compromising Russell was to emerge as central to the intense political debates that would engulf a divided IRA, preferring the beginning of a new military campaign than flirtation with class politics. For years, regarded as a gifted operator within the IRA leadership, Russell's disillusionment with new political drift would see him begin to operate outside the IRA Army Council to increase his influence over IRA members, all with the aid of a key ally in the United States. And I'll detail this more. So in August 1931, Russell, on behalf of the Army Council, visited the United States in a format raising tour for the IRA. And the picture on the right is actually from a later tour. However, he generally found Clan Miguel, the support organization for Irish Republicanism within the States, had greatly diminished in terms of fundraising and membership, not dissimilar to the IRA, of course. However, Russell built important contacts there among the more militant, militant adherents within the Irish American diaspora that would prove important some years later. Along with his continuing work as quartermaster, which partially involved regular visits to various IRA units, Russell cultivated an important support base within the IRA that was to help him greatly in the years ahead. In the interim, the political fortunes of the IRA within the jurisdiction of the Irish Free State were to change dramatically. 
Much of this period involved major debate within the IRA and the encouragement of a more leftist strip to embrace the class politics by leading figures such as Pat O'Donnell, Sean McBride and Frank Ryan. George Gilmore, who associated with those in support of this direction, recalled Russell's own reticence with such debates. Gilmore later wrote, Russell was not interested in political questions. His sole interest was in ornaments. He would impatiently refuse to talk politics. These debates with the IRA took place against the backdrop of Fianna Fáil led by de Valera, at last winning a majority in the 1932 election in the, free, in the Irish Free State. Along with a further election win in 1933, which cemented de Valera's popularity with much of the Republican constituency. De Valera was keen for the IRA to lead the stage and recognize the government's mandate as reflective of widespread support for new Republican form of constitutionalism and his promise to dismantle aspects of the treaty settlement. The leadership of the IRA, despite seeing a ban of the organization being lifted, was to find the new political dispensation increasingly challenging, facing both continuing dwindling resources and reduced membership. Of interest, Russell was the main speaker at the commemoration for Wolf Town at Bowdenstown in June 1932. And see an image there on the left from the Irish Independence. There, only five months after Fianna Fáil coming to government, he said to the crowd, Tone's ideals have not yet been realized. We have two regiments of the British Army, one dressed in khaki in the north and the other dressed in green in the south and a representative of the English King in both places. The civil service, as in civil service down here, is part of the old British machine through which England rules Ireland. No speech making or negotiations with Westminster will result in an honorable settlement for Ireland. Russell also played a central role in IRA intervention during the 1933 Northern Railway strike and seemed enthusiastic about the prospect of evolving Protestant strikers. This apparently did not translate into becoming a firm advocate of trade unionist politics, despite IRA flirtation of strike activity in both jurisdictions early in the decade. On occasion, he took on the role of a public speaker for the Republican cause, as you can see at both the stand, such as on behalf of an abstentious Republican candidate running for Stormont in 1933, in which Russell trolled a crowd and poured it down that, quote, the day was fast approaching when the sectarian catch cries which divided the people of the North would disappear. And it's a further insight into his political thinking in terms of the primacy of military action is reflected in an oration by Russell at an Easter commemoration taking place at Drumbo Castle in April 1933, the site of the execution of four anti-treaty IRA volunteers during the Civil War. Referring to the current political setup in the Irish Free State, Russell referred to, quote, how all our national weaknesses are due to short-sightedness, to our proneness to stray away into bypaths where our true national vision becomes obscured. Russell noted how, quote, our moral right to arm, to equip to defend our nation by arms, is questioned. He pointed out to those gathered, quote, you have a national obligation and a moral right to fight for your national rights, your country's freedom. Russell dismissed Fianna Fáil's efforts to far in government, referring to their entry into, into Leicester House in 1927 as, quote, a desertion of the Republic. The gradual dismantling of the various terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty were referred to, quote, how instead of scrapping the treaty, they, Fianna Fáil, offer you a popularised treaty. The IRA quartermaster displayed little ambiguity when imploring Republicans to, quote, never again allow it to happen, that moral right give way to political convenience. Russell would, in fact, later write of a two-hour meeting he had in government buildings with de Valera in 1934, in the latter's capacity as president of the Executive Council, the latter having requested Russell's presence as a member of the IRA leadership. Russell claimed de Valera pushed for unity between the IRA and Fianna Fáil, provided the IRA surrendered its arms to the government and ceased all military training. When Russell dismissed the ideas as impractical, he suggested cooperation of the IRA provided, quote, de Valera put the issue of the Republic before the people at the next general election and support it or declare the Republic within a reasonable time. When Russell pushed for this proposed period to be five years, he added to de Valera, in the meantime, you, have no embar you will have no embarrassment so far as we, the IRA, are concerned, as we will cooperate with you in every way, provided de Valera agrees to declare the Republic. De Valera, in Russell's account, quickly dismissed the idea and brought the meeting to a close. Now, the departure of many left-wing IRA activists throughout the 1930s, particularly on the founding of the ill-fated Republican Congress in 1934, would not only remove considerable political talent from within the organization, but ultimately allow for the more militant strength to dominate such as that represented by Russell himself. The historian Sean Cronin, who was later a successor as IRA chief of staff, concluded, 
Russell, of all the IRA leaders of the 1920s and 30s, was probably the most conservative politically and socially. Now, given his personal leanings, Russell would emerge as the chief proponents of a new bombing campaign on, in England, similar to earlier Republican efforts in the 1880s and 1920. Given his frequent contact with IRA units as quartermaster, Russell gained a loyal group of followers whom the idea of renewed military action against England greatly appealed. A key relationship for Russell outside Ireland was his association with Joseph McGarrity, the Philadelphia-based leader of Clan Nagale. And if you look at that photo on the right, you can actually see McGarrity sitting on the chair behind Russell. Given the constitutional drift of Fianna Fáil, McGarrity, who was formerly a key ally of de Valera during the 1919 to 20 period, had grown distant from de Valera and had little appreciated or understood Fianna Fáil's success. McGarrity was also considerably disenchanted with the inner convulsions within the IRA, over its political direction, and no solid plan for a new military campaign. And Sean Russell, McGarrity found a willing and seemingly capable ally. Moss Timmy felt Russell's and McGarrity's close association was because both men were alike in their single-mindedness and in their ability to overcome opposition by ignoring its existence. Russell visited the United States in July of 1936 and met McGarrity. Both men reached, quote, a complete understanding of this new campaign, but McGarrity promising finance and vital resources. And as a third trialant, Russell wrote to McGarrity, referring to his allies within the IRA, that the idea has been accepted favorably all round. We are hoping to make a start before long. In May 1936, the IRA Chief of Staff, Moss Toomey, had been arrested by the state security forces in the Free State following a spat of IRA activities, which culminated in the impatient Fianna Fáil government again declaring the IRA an illegal organisation. They'd lifted this ban previously in 32. Sean McBride was co-opted as Chief of Staff, and in the following months, clashed with Russell, who frequently advocated for his proposed bombing campaign in England. Tom Barry, also on the IRA Army Council, was dismissive of Russell's idea, and wanted to push for the court martial of Russell over an apparent misappropriation of IRA funds and arms. Dan Gleeson, later interviewed by the historian Yunshin McGowan, was one IRA leader involved in the court martial of Russell, which took place in January 1937. Gleeson felt it was a fiasco, particularly as Russell chose to have no one speak in his defence. Gleeson felt no one present involved were happy in their roles, though it was regarded as a positive and Russell was finally expelled. Now, it should be noted that the consensus appeared to be Russell kept none of the funds for himself, having instead spent it on IRA activities, but without the approval of the Army Council. The chief purpose of the affair was to marginalize the increasingly independent-minded independent minded Russell. Now, even this seeming setback was not to prove any kind of debtor for, for Russell's ambitions or that of his most prominent ally, McGarrity. Russell was invited to return for a public speaking tour across the United States throughout the summer of 1937. And I'm fairly certain that's where the photograph on the right comes from which is extraordinary given his previous dismissal from the IRA. The Russell was to find clan membership and financial support poor in certain areas. He felt that his promise of a new campaign had, in his own words, created a new interest in Irish affairs. And that much can be achieved if a good, strong national stand is made by our people at home. Now, Russell was determined to, that the proposed campaign would take place with or without the support of the IRA Army Council. Writing in McGarrity in November 1937, Russell made clear that he and his allies, quote, have already sufficient men who are capable of putting our policy into effect. And we fully realize that force, the example, and the crucial support which will inevitably come to us with our initial successes. Russell seems was intending that the proposed IRA convention in April 1938 would dramatically accelerate the timeline for the bombing campaign in England, given some IRA units preferred to wait until then. At the convention, the current chief of staff, Tom Barry, led the opposition to the, to the, to the proposed English campaign declaring to those gathered it was as doomed to failure as the Fenian dynamiters of the 1880s. Barry's preference the last number of years with the IRA to push for a campaign within the Northern Ireland state, feeling there were enough military targets for the IRA in the six counties. However, Russell supporters won the day in a majority vote, with Russell installed as chief of staff. Barry and four others resigned from the IRA executive, arguing the IRA Army Council had behaved unconstitutionally in appointing a dismissed volunteer as chief of staff, it was the end of Tom Barry's sometimes turbulent career in the IRA, now having no confidence in the new leadership and feeling the proposed new campaign was, quote, unethical and immoral. Now, however dubious the methods used in gaining this new role, Sean Russell had now at last ascended to the head of the organization he had devoted much of his adult life to, wherever the greatly diminished fortunes of the organization were now were certainly no guarantee of future success. 
Russell and his allies wasted no time making contact with IRA activists in both Ireland and England and began major efforts at training the use of explosive devices in secret locations. One important recruit to Russell's ranks was the turn of Seamus O'Donovan, who nearly would be worth a presentation himself, I'd argue. O'Donovan was the former IRA director of chemicals who devised the overall strategy for the sabotage campaign, known more properly as the S-Plan. O'Donovan's strategies involved the bombing of key commercial and infrastructural targets across England. O'Donovan had been absent from IRA activities since the Civil War and pers been personally convinced by Russell to return to the ranks. And you see this with a number of individuals as well. Paddy McGrath is another example, who was later executed in 1940. He was an earlier veteran who had left after the Civil War and Russell coached them back to the organisation. Not all those within the IRA shared Russell's heightened confidence that the campaign could succeed. Moss Toomey, released from prison, stayed on briefly as Adjutant General on Russell's staff. Along with Sean McNeil, Toomey toured IRA units in England ahead of the campaign start, but was disheartened at what he found in terms of preparedness and resources, and he ultimately departed from the IRA, though he still remained a major supporter even of the provisional IRA up until his death in the 70s. Russell also devised with his allies a new political formula for the IRA. Since 1922, a certain contingent of anti-treaty Republican TDs, who were members of the Second All Aaron, continued to meet as the de jure, but not de facto, Republican government. This is in light of their view that the Second Dáil had never been dissolved prior to the events of the Civil War, and their own refusal to recognise the institutions of the Irish Free State. With the convulsion within the wider Republican movement during the 1920s, the IRA had actually withdrawn its support for this body by 1925. By 1938, the number of these surviving fundamentalist Republican deputies had dwindled to seven, solely supported by an even more minuscule Sinn Féin party. Russell now devised an intriguing strategy involving this grouping, related to a little recalled decision reached by Dahl Aaron on the 11th of March, 1921. This decision may mention of when circumstances such as war reduced the makeup of the Dahl to five deputies, government duties should be handed to the leadership of the volunteers, the IRA. Russell met this grouping, now led by Mary McSweeney, sister of hunger striker Terence McSweeney, at her home on the 8th of December, 1838, the anniversary of the execution of IRA leaders in Mount Joy in 1922. After a brief discussion, this group of deputies agreed to hand over their, quote, executive authority to the IRA Army Council and pass the resolution as follows. We hereby delegate the authority proposed to us to the Army Council in the spirit of the decision taken by the Dáil in the spring of 1921. So in keeping with this Republican belief, the IRA Army Council, in their view, could now claim to be the de jure government of the Irish Republic as declared in 1916. For Russell and his allies, this is an important tool in their propaganda. And this would later have a long life within a certain section of Republicanism itself, as seen with Tom McGuire in 1969 and later in 1986. Now, shortly thereafter, Russell called the general meeting of the IRA convention in Dublin. There, the 50 delegates reaffirmed their support for him. On the 12th of January 1939, a statement was issued to the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, signed on behalf of the Republican government and the army, giving notice to the British government to withdraw all military forces from Ireland. If not, the IRA would be compelled to intervene actively in the military or commercial life of your country, as, as your government are interfering in ours. So on Monday, the 16th of January 1939, the bombings began with seven major explosions on power stations and electrical lines across England. Now, despite this initial moderate success, the campaign soon fell aground. Intelligence failures, most disastrously, the authorities come into possession of the S plan, mass arrests, the inevitable civilian casualties diminished whatever momentum the campaign could have had. One chief reason for its failure was the unfamiliarity of many IRA volunteers with the country in which they were now operating. As IRA veteran Dan Keating recalled, there were too many people sent over who had no knowledge whatsoever of the country or where they were going. Writing to McGarrity in March 1939, Russell talked the opening of the campaign with some slight acknowledgments its effects were perhaps not to his liking. He wrote, our successes though perhaps small had gone to the volunteers heads. They realized they have a big job and maybe a long one and they're preparing steadily for it. Now with the same letter, Russell makes an intriguing reference to represent the German government meeting the IRA leadership at this time. And I've noted this is of course against the backdrop of De Valera's government embarking a long-term strategy of neutrality later during the war years, though clandestinely supporting the Allies. A meeting had taken place in February 1939 between Russell and other IRA leaders with a German agent, Oscar Faust, who had secretly arrived in Ireland. This exchange left Russell elated at the prospect of munitions and arms being supplied by Hitler's government in Berlin, which ultimately never really materialised for the English campaign. 
Russell, meanwhile, had departed for the United States for another fundraising tour in April 1939. Now, this would come at a particularly difficult time for Russell's leadership, as elements within the IRA were already growing wary at the prospect of any success in the bombing campaign, least of which the decisions of the chief of staff. Sean Fuller, who was, operating up, who was involved in operations in Birmingham, even made a direct individual appeal to Russell to halt the campaign following a spate of arrests of Republican activists. The campaign's main architect, however, refused to be deterred. From the US, he revealed a burgeoning confidence when he wrote to his temporary replacement to Stephen Hayes, sorry, his temporary replacement as chief of staff, Stephen Hayes, who he actually appointed without any formal ratification by the Army Council. Russell wrote to Hayes, Every day I feel more and more assured of success. Every day I find those who for years saw no future for the IRA and no hope of national revival coming back to the clan to offer help. Nobody now can say the Irish question is settled for all time. The letter, the letter closed with a promise from Russell to Hayes to return home to Ireland soon. However, seemingly promising new developments were to delay Russell's homecoming for the immediate future. And over the course of the sabotage campaign in England from January 1939 to March 1940, but 100 Republican men and women have been sentenced to various terms of penal servitude and two IRA men executed. The final total for the campaign was 300 explosions, 10 deaths, including seven civilians, and 96 injuries across England. By any measure, this overly ambitious campaign had failed. The idea could gain enough momentum to bring the British to the negotiating table was deemed quite rightly in the view of a recent study to be ludicrous. But considering the controversy over Russell's visit to Germany in mid-1940, that continues to rage. At the time, it was his visit to the United States in mid-1939 that generated enormous controversy. When one looks at contemporary news coverage, particularly within the US itself, you see, you see people writing columns on this and everything. Speaking to one crowd in LA in May 1939, Russell claimed he had ordered the recent bombings. Speaking to another crowd a week later in San Francisco, Russell made no secret of his association with the IRA, proclaiming a state of war exists between Ireland and Britain and added, we declared war on the 12th of last January. Russell had been watched by the US authorities for several weeks at the request of Scotland Yard, who had been seeking his extradition to Britain due to the bombings. Five weeks into his American tour on the 8th of June, 1939, Russell was arrested with Joe McGarrity outside a railway station in Michigan. While McGarrity was quickly released, Russell was held in the detention center to Detroit where this extraordinary photograph on the left of Russell was taken by the Associated Press. At the time of his arrest, King George VI was actually on a state visit to Canada with a further visit planned shortly for the United States. And much of the press at the time speculated Russell's arrest was due to this. When interviewed by the Associated Press, and the whole, it's a rather extraordinary piece, Russell remarked, I do not like the intimation that my visit here had anything to do with the visit of royalty. Why should I care about the King and Queen? I wish I'd never come here. I assure you, I did not have the faintest idea the King and Queen were going to be anywhere near Detroit. Now, the official explanation for Russell's detention was given as overseeing a temporary 30-day visa. And he was actually eventually released due to members of Congress lobbying President Roosevelt and the State Department for his release and the storm of controversy that ensued. I think there was, there was thing like over 100 members of Congress, the US Congress signed a letter demanding Russell's release and saying they wouldn't actually attend the official reception of King George VI. It's almost worth the, the talk in itself at that whole event. But it was finally in mid-1940, while on bail, that Russell secretly traveled from the United States to Berlin with the aid of American supporters. I actually have to thank the uh, Jack Clark collection in Ballina on the left for that image of Russell. There's some brilliant items from the 1940s in their collection. In Berlin, Russell was accredited with full diplomatic privilege by the German authorities. And just to be clear, this built on previous contacts the IRA had in previous years of the Nazi government by way of Sean McBride and Tom Barry and Seamus Donovan. But this, this is Russell's first. Uh, for, well, his only visit, of course, to, to Germany. Russell was given a villa in the Grunewald suburb with extensive grounds, a library, war maps, and a radio. Sean Cronin later speculated that given he was a frugal man, Russell may not have been impressed by being given such attention. And you often hear that about Russell, that, you know, he, he wasn't a man who really was, he, you know, he didn't like that kind of attention. And, you know, he, he, you know, he liked to live uh, quite normally. Nonetheless, given that Russell... Given that he was given such attention, reflected the importance of Russell's presence in the eyes of the German authorities. Russell had his closest contact with Edmund Wessenmayer, the German Foreign Office's special advisor in Ireland. And it's worth noting that Wessenmayer was actually to be a key architect of the Nazis' Holocaust policies in both Hungary and Croatia. 
In late May, Russell was trained in the use of sabotage material and held conferences with German military leaders and possible actions on the English mainland. What remains clear is that no definite plans were agreed to, save for the possible transport of Russell back to Ireland. Russell also met Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister, who seemed impressed by the IRA chief of staff. Russell was sure to keep the German authorities at arm's length, wanting no strings attached for anything supplied to the IRA, but made one specific request, the reason's old comrade Frank Ryan, there on the left from the Spanish prison. Ryan had been held in Burgess prison following as part of the Irish Brigade, who fought with Spanish Republicans against the forces of Franco in the recent Spanish Civil War. Now, both he and Russell had gone on considerably different political trajectories since the convulsions within the IRA in the early 1930s, beginning with Ryan's departure from the IRA to join the ill-fated Republican Congress. Ryan was brought to Berlin in early August, where Vesemir watched the reunion of the two former comrades with interest. Sean Russell allegedly threw his arm around Ryan and said, I'm going to Ireland tomorrow, Frank. Will you come with me? Ryan readily agreed. Well, this may seem surprising in light of their political differences. Ryan later explained in a letter to the Irish minister of Madrid, in Madrid, Leopold Kearney, that Russell and I were always good personal friends, despite their differences. Now, Sean Russell's brief time as a guest in the Nazi government in mid-1940 is unquestionably the main issue of contention in his wider legacy. Erwin Lahausen, head of the second bureau of the German intelligence service from 1939 to 43, later claimed that Russell denounced the Nazis' attempts to indoctrinate him into their ideology during his time in Berlin. The quote, which is much cited by Latter-day Defenders, allegedly said by Russell is as follows. Russell said, I am not a Nazi. I'm not even pro-German. I'm an Irishman fighting for the independence of Ireland. The British have been our enemies for hundreds of years. They are the enemies of Germany today. If it suits Germany to give us help to achieve independence, I am willing to accept it, but no more, and there must be no strings to help. Now, it's worth recalling that Lahosen only provided this quote in 1958, nearly two decades after Russell's death. Lahosen also talked about Russell as a hypersensitive Celt who regarded the Nazi philosophy as anathema. Yet Russell still, sorry, yet Lahosen still took a strong personal liking to what he calls the curious Irishman, admiring his integrity and his honesty. And it's worth noting, actually, a separate source, no less than the British Secret Service, who might be assumed eager to prove a link between Russell and the Nazis, was to ultimately conclude that Russell displayed, quote, considerable reticence toward the Germans and plainly did not regard himself as a German agent. This was conducted after the war, that, this, that they interviewed um, Nazi war criminals. Now, in this respect, if you consider both separate sources, there is a considerable ring of truth in Lahosen's recollections of Russell and his, you know, dislike of Nazi ideology. Now, the mission to send both Ryan and Russell back on their fateful journey to Ireland aboard a German U-boat was named Operation Dove. A surviving Amber War diary that Sean Cronin later quoted made clear that, quote, Russell was given no definite assignment of any sort. All the German Foreign Office gives him is the chance to make use of Ireland's opportunity. Apparently, all Russell had in terms of luggage was a special wireless set to communicate with Berlin in a code. The Ryan was a fellow passenger. It would become soon apparent he was not privy to Russell's exact plans. And their destination was to land at Smerwick Bay on the Dingle Peninsula by August 15th and make their way to Dublin from there. And though the U boats successfully made it to the British blockade, the cramped quarters and lack of fresh air and exercise proved arduous for both men, faithfully so for Russell. From the outset of the journey, Russell suffered severe vomiting and stomach pains. And despite the efforts of a medical orderly and Ryan himself, Russell's cramps increased in severity, and he died on the 14th of August with the U boat hundreds of miles west of Galway. He died in Ryan's arms. And then Russell was buried ingloriously at sea wrapped in a blanket, though other accounts suggest a tricolour or a Nazi flag. The tricolour detail actually comes from Lehausen, and it's the United Irishman in 1951 that alleges he was buried in Nazi flag. So a couple of conflicting sources there. I personally think he was just wrapped in a blanket and buried at sea. On his return to Berlin, Ryan gave two sworn affidavits to the German authorities, where subsequently two leading positions deduced that Russell probably died of a burst ulcer. Ryan himself rubbish speculation, and there was a lot of it, after Russell's death, writing to Leopold Kearney the following year, these rumours of Russell having met a violent death in Gibraltar and Barcelona are absurd. I think one alleges that he, the MI5 assassinated him in Macedonia. Bizarre. And Ryan goes on, he says, to my knowledge, he never set foot in either place. The other rumour about my part in alleged assassination doesn't worry me, and it didn't worry Ryan because he knew the truth, he was there. Ryan also hoped to return Russell's personal affection, including his watch to his relatives in Dublin. And Godspeed the day he ended the letter. Of course, he was never to do that. 
He never got the chance. Ryan died in hospital in Dresden in the summer of 1944 due to, due to pneumonia. His body was later repatriated to Ireland in 1979. Very impressive monuments over his grave, actually, in Glasnevin. Dr. Bessemer, who had come to hold John Russell in high regard, opted to preserve Russell's personal affection papers for his relatives. And Russell also apparently sat for a portrait during his time in Germany that even his family inquired of in a file in the National Archives of the Gardaí in, the, in uh, the 1940s. However, all of these effects and the painting, if it ever existed, was lost in later Allies, Allied air raids on Germany. Now, by the end of the war, mass and and multiple executions of Republicans by the government of de Valera against the backdrop of the failed campaign in England greatly diminished the fortunes of a profoundly demoralized IRA. Now, the, the IRA's connection with the Nazi government through this period remains a murky, confused one. At the time of Russell's stay in Berlin and thereafter, there were strange episodes and convoluted episodes in Ireland involving German spies and their associations with Republicans. Consistently, or at least early on, German officials seemed to assume the IRA, even with their small membership, had a more inflated role in Ireland itself, particularly in terms of their influence on de Valera's government. The full story of the Nazi government's involvement the IRA during the Second World War is beyond the context of this talk. Following Russell's death in August 1940, his replacement as chief of staff, Stephen Hayes, who was later accused of being an informer, sanctioned a strategy called Plan Kathleen, which would involve the invasion of Northern Ireland by Nazi Germany to be assisted by the IRA. A failed Northern campaign by the IRA in 1942 also received little support or aid from Germany, and they apparently were not impressed with the proposed Plan Kathleen either. The reticence of the Germans is, is reflected in the recollections of one Nazi agent of Ireland, Ireland Hermann Goertz, who wrote following the war, or rather he was interviewed following the war, in spite of the fine qualities of individual IRA men, as a body I consider them worthless. A leader was boasted to me that he had in a certain district, I was not really interested, 5,000 sworn members. I answered him that I personally would be completely satisfied with 500 men who knew how to obey an order. I would march into Belfast and destroy the Harlan and Wolf shipyards, and these men would have done more for Ireland than 5,000 talking about the second dawn and the third dawn and their legality. Now, Gortz himself committed suicide while in Dublin in 1947, and the clipping on the right is from his funeral in 1947. You notice the coffin draped the Nazi flag as carried to Dublin City, and I believe he's buried actually up in that German war cemetery up in the, the Moor Mountains. That there is just this explicit pro-Nazi sentiment among individual IRA mem membership, sorry, among individual IRA memberships and other Irish public figures reflected even in occasional pieces within Republican periodicals during the war years is on the historical record. Historian Brian Hanley has noted how it is clear that at least a section of the IRA leadership were attracted by Nazism's success. In addition, Hanley noted by 1940, some Republicans in blue shirts mixed openly in pro-Nazi organizations in Ireland, that there also existed a pro-German and Nazi sentiment in other areas of Irish society outside the political mainstream was also the subject of several studies. Now, ultimately, it will remain a subject of conjecture. What exactly long-term would have been the results of further contacts between Russell and the German authorities had he lived, particularly at the tide of the war, turn in Germany's favour? While not accurate to call Russell a Nazi collaborator in the true academic fashion, I wouldn't call him a Nazi collaborator. He was clearly regarded by the Nazi military and intelligence as a potential future collaborator, and it is unquestionable, questionably elements within the IRA leadership, as demonstrated by Hayes after Russell's death, were willing to assist Nazi Germany in the case of a potential invasion. And while one can accept Russell himself was not sympathetic to Nazi or a fascist, one can accept, one can even accept that all the IRA, particularly under Russell, all they wanted was arms. One cannot regard the IRA's alliance with Nazi elements as a mutual relationship of equals. Russell may not have been a collaborator in the true definition of one, but he was clearly regarded as a would-be or potential collaborator by the Germans themselves, should they ever turn their attention to Ireland. I'll also briefly refer to the bombing of North Strand on the 30th and 31st of May, almost 10 months after Russell's death. The photograph in the bottom left-hand corner here is from the aftermath, and the bombing itself resulted in the deaths of 28 people, injuring over 90 and 300 homes being destroyed. While not the first bombing by German aircraft and parts of neutral era during the Second World War, it was the most devastating. And it's worth noting, not only were these Russell's fellow Irishmen and women who suffered injury and death from his would-be benefactors, but it occurred within his former neighbourhood, his victims being the victims of that bombing, being his own neighbours. Now, the photograph of the left is from the unveiling of the first statue to Russell in Fairview Park in 1951, funded by his supporters in Clannagale in 19... funded by his supporters in Clannagale, 
Commemoration of Russland's so form and jurist the present day, most prominently in the form of the current statue erected in 2009. Now, the original statue actually has an interesting afterlife, and I was blown away to find this out. It was actually rescued. You remember the decapitated statue we saw? It was rescued and restored by the late great historian Martin O'Dwyer. And it's actually currently on display in the Cashel Folk Village in Tipperary. There it is in the, in the middle photo there at the very top. And below, of course, is the statue in Fairview Park. So next time, whenever we have the debate on the merits of having a statue to Russell, I would advise anyone surprising someone who disagrees with it by mentioning there are in fact two statues of Sean Russell today standing in Ireland. And I must note, and I don't think this is said enough, to be honest, not only is the statue of Fairview Park a statue to Russell himself, but it's actually a memorial to all the IRA dead of the 1930s and 40s, the names, the names on different plaques on the plinth. Of it. So, you know, IRA members killed by hunger strike or, you know, execution or other means. So after the unveiling of the first statue on, the, on Sunday, the 9th of September, 1951, an impressive crowd gathered at Fair, sorry, my apologies. At the, the impressive crowd gathered at Fairview Park for the unveiling of the statue. And as you can see, Russell was depicted on the large plinth suit him with his right, right fist clenched in defiance. Later, <laughs> they interpreted it as a communist salute, if you believe it. The rubble of the news sheet that you had an Irishman noted the parade that marched from Parnell Square, which represented groups across the breadth of militant Irish republicanism and included units of the IRA, Cumann and Sinn Féin, along with members of Fine Aaron, Cumann and Mon, Cumann and Colleeny, and of course, Clan the Gale. There are also representatives in Dublin City Council and the GAA, and there's a brilliant uh, Garda Special Branch report in the National Archives listing the names of all those present, and she has some fascinating names that were much more prominent later on in republicanism, like uh, Rory O'Brody and Cotter Goulding. And Brendan Bean was there, actually, of interest, which is of interest. The main speaker at the unveiling was Mr. T.A. McGonagall of Clannock Gale, the Irish-American Republican support organization who had funded the monument. McGonagall demonstrated the respect Russell's old allies in the U.S. still held, from referring to him as one of Ireland's greatest soldiers and one of the most unselfish characters I've ever known. In the same issue, the, uh, the United Irishman, a detailed account of Russell's final days ended with the statement, Sean Russell, worthy successor of Tony Casement. The reference itself was a none too subtle allusion between Russell seeking aid from the government of Germany to earlier represented by Republicans such as Tone and Casement to secure international help for the Republican cause. Now, it's striking that Russell received such praise and a statue only over a decade after his death and in such a tribute. Particularly, the more well-known earlier figures from the pantheon of Irish Republicanism still lacked any similar monument at that time. Yet such contemporary tributes do much to obscure the murky circumstances of Russell's passing, not to mention how much he was a divisive figure within the IRA in the final decade of his life. Yet for much of his revolutionary career, True to the rising of the Civil War, he was recognized as a charismatic leader and not in the least lacking in physical courage, highly capable in his various leadership roles. The huge compliments came from figures who diverged later from him politically, such as Oscar Trainer and Lean Daly as striking. His contemporaries through the 1920s and 30s, even those who eventually opposed him, still widely recognized his personal sincerity and his firm, if unsophisticated, Republican beliefs. How did Russell regard his own personal ideology? particularly with the drift of elements within the IRA toward a more radical left-wing direction in the 30s. And I'm going to finish up on this. While there's little evidence of written tracks in the existing archival material in which Russell details Republican thinking, his contemporary communications with his peers, such as McGarrity, in addition to accounts of political activities through this period, give the portrait of a very determined militant, firmly set on strictly military action and with a, and with a great desire for swift, decisive action on the part of the IRA. Well, however, there is some evidence for us to recognize some degree of potential in the IRA engaging political activity, provided it shared the ultimate aim of his own organization. Russell's limited involvement in strike activity did not lead to the development of a distinct political strain in his own ideology, more likely making him assured of his own brand of traditional militant republicanism. Nonetheless, from the beginning of the 1930s, Russell emerged as a divisive figure amongst his peers. Alongside this, he initially acted outside the ranks of the IRA to plot the ill-fated bombing campaign in England, you know, whatever the disastrous outcome of this campaign, military failure would little diminish the consistent nature of Republican commemoration of him. That also was a strictly military figure made some effort and that made some effort to bring his allies along to the promised land of separation from Britain, goes some way to explaining him being des deemed deserving of a memorial by his former comrades in 1951. The historian Yoshimi Kion has argued that central to understanding Russell's appeal in Republicanism at the time was that of becoming chief of staff in 1938, that to many in the IRA, he gave the organization a real focus lacking since the Civil War. 
Yet it's to his later day critics, it is abhorrent Russell little comprehended the consequences of associating with the Nazis already, even though they would come out more in the Nuremberg trials, an array of documented repression of the Jewish populace. And it, of course, his increasingly ambitious military efforts across Europe by the time of his German visit. In this, as pointed out by Roanne O'Donnell, Russell undoubtedly betrayed a degree of political naivety, in addition to perhaps a fervent, unsophisticated belief in his own cause. All these were traits very typical of an individual who cared little for pushing the IRA in a new, perhaps more relevant direction. But ultimately, we have to conclude there is very little evidence Sean Russell was ever a true sympathizer to Nazi ideology. His chief purpose must be understood as seeking a political alliance as a means to a strictly, perhaps ill-defined military end. This was also true of Russell holding little sympathies with the world communist movement, similarly traveling with an IRA delegation to Soviet Russia in 1925. That continued contact with Nazi intelligence had he lived could have met with any greater success than his other mixed efforts as IRA chief of staff, one can only ever speculate. In addition, historical discussion of the strength of the IRA connections with Nazi Germany and the nature of Russell's central role in it should not be casually dismissed as typical of previous Irish Republican efforts of seeking military aid outside Ireland and should be rightly contextualized within the international situation at the time. In summary, that the loudest voices on both sides of the debate over Russell's statue remain strictly partisan, it is likely they will continue to be aired regarding the memorial to this controversial figure. Through the existing material, Sean Russell himself emerges as a charismatic figure and not in the least lacking in physical courage, highly capable in his various leadership roles. His striking similar compliments as said came from figures later of their version politically. As the historian Una Halpin has noted, Sean Russell was a professional revolutionary of an intensity, commitment, and endurance unusual even within the Republican movement. And so to end, the combination of both new and old sources in archives give a chance to illuminate the life of this controversial, frustrating, and often enigmatic figure. In understanding Sean Russell as much as the archival material allows, we can further expand our understanding of the endurance of the political tradition of militant Irish republicanism across both pre and post independence in the early 20th century Ireland. Thank you all very much. And apologies, I went on a bit too long. <laughs> There we go. Go back. Okay. So, Katrina, I assume questions or whatever happens next. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no, so, thank right. you very much, uh, Jared, for what was a, a really fascinating insight into Sean Russell, and I suppose uh, in particular for providing much needed context that we need to understand the man. So as usual now, uh, we'll open the floor to questions. So if uh, people can just go to the bottom, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the reactions button. If you click that to raise your hand, um, and then when we call you, then you can unmute yourself and just ask away if that's okay. Or if you want to put a question into the chat box as well. We have a chat in here from uh, Tony McGrath. He's asked, he said, very enjoyable and enlightening. Thank you. Uh, the current statue is dated as 2007. Okay. Is it known who funded this? And was there any objections to unveiling it at the time? Or did Nazi, the Nazi link happen after that? Well, thanks for the clarification on the, on the year, uh, Tony. Um, the, gra the, um, the statue was funded by the National Graves Association. Uh, they're a Republican commemorative body that have been around since the mid-1920s. Um, I know there's offshoots up in uh, Tyrone and Belfast, but the, the, the main, the organisation since the 20s are based uh, down in this jurisdiction. I know the Secretary Matt Doyle very well. Um, he, he explained to me how they went about that. Um, I, I, think, I think because the statue was getting, the original statue was getting damaged so much, um, they they would have a subscription for members, but they've often done appeals for kind of new memorials and that, particularly if the St. Paul's Monument of the Glass Seven actually was a brilliant recent example of that, actually. And um, I, I believe they would have sought funds from their members and, you know, public appeals and that. Like, um, I, I, I think there was objections at the time. I mean, I, I've, read, I've collected so much between letters and different columns about the, the statue, even, even from the 50s, like... Um, yeah, I, I think there was objections. I, I think I, I think there was one surprise that like um because I, I think I, I think that I'm not I can, this can be clarified for me by someone, but I think the National Great Association 
own that patch of land that the statue's on, you'll notice it's in within a, a fence. So they actually had ownership of that previous to the erection of the new statue. So they, they own that. So they could do, uh, not maybe what they wanted, but they, they wanted to put up a new statue there too. Um, uh, no, that there was objection. You're asking, was there objections in terms of the, the, the link with Sean Russell and the Nazis? There's always been objections to it based on that. Like even um, in, I think it's 2003, uh, the current president of Sinn Féin, Mary Lou MacDonald, spoke to Sinn Féin commemoration there. And there was objections at the time raising that because I, I know uh, Mary Lou was running for the European elections at the time, or I think within the following year. And there was a couple of columns and letters from the usual quarters related to that. So that, that, that controversy is always an hour. Um, there wasn't, it has been alleged, and I'll be honest with you, I can't find an exact article on it, but it was alleged that um, you'll notice in the original statue in 1951, Russell's arm is in a clenched white fist. That was perceived by some elements as a pro communist salute, and the arm was broken off. Now, I can't find a news article stating that's why it was broken off. That's alleged later on that that's why it was broken off by kind of, you know, fascist elements within our society here. Actually broke the arm off for that reason. So it's interesting how, you know, well, he was a Nazi. No, he was a communist. Like, and that's why we're going to damage and vandalize the statue. It's I like, like, like even when I was, I was going over the material, you almost could do a presentation on the statue itself. Or as I, as I, as I mentioned at the end, the statues of Sean Wilson mm. that exist, like just in terms of the debate and, you know, how they came to be and so on. Um, like even, even the statue, the original statue in 51, it's clearly that was a project by his Irish American support base. Like the main speaker was the uh, That's strictly in Irish America that put that statue up too at the time. Thanks for that. Yeah, statues are <clears throat> generally quite controversial uh, objects in the current political climate anyway. Uh, we have a comment from Audrey McCready who says, very balanced presentation on Russell's life rather tragic that he couldn't move on from military activity to politics. Yeah, some have made that observation. I actually was in, uh, just, on, uh, just on that, I was in um, I was in the Irish Ministry Archives recently, and I'd recommend this for anyone, particularly if you're familiar with Duncan McKeown's works, but I listened to a lot of audio interviews he did with IRA veterans in the 80s and 90s. A lot of them were veterans, not only from the revolutionary period, but right up to the 30s and 40s. And uh, he interviews Pat O'Donnell. And like, what's great about those interviews, those audio interviews, a lot of it McKeown never published, or he kind of, you know, sometimes he kind of abbreviated what they said. So it's good to hear fully what they said, but a lot of them are very candid on Sean Russell. And McKeown himself, a Republican veteran, joined the IRA at that time. So he has opinions on Russell himself. But when he's interviewing Pat O'Donnell, Pat O'Donnell says that when they were all expelled from the IRA due to the kind of left for drift some of them were going on, he was worried because he said, he, he, like paraphrasing O'Donnell, but he said, like, once they all departed in the 30s, he knew the IRA was headed for disaster. Well, that's what he claims. He knew the IRA was headed for disaster because people like Russell would then be in charge in their absence. So it's interesting you have a contemporary saying a tragedy, just a tragedy in that sense, is in, like, who are leaving behind the IRA in charge. Okay, and we have another comment from Tony McGrath who says um, that um, 2007 is on the cuff of one of his trousers. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, thanks. No, it's funny because the pamphlet, I have a pamphlet in the National Graves that, um, it's dated 2009, and maybe they just issued that in 2009. Like, so no, I got back. No, I really do appreciate the clarity. Thank you. Okay, um, lots of people commenting on how informative and enjoyable the presentation was. Uh, do we have anybody who'd like to ask any more questions? Hugo, you were talking earlier about, um, the list uh, of people who attended to uh, attended one of the um, was it one of the commemorations? Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? What I was saying was, um, my grandfather went to the unveiling of the statue. Now he 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 would have gone in a personal capacity, but he would also as he had the gun permit for the first battalion for commemorations, so right. he would have been very mindful that. He wasn't just going on a personal level. Mm. He was actually going to represent the battalion. Mm. And he, he didn't do these things lightly. Mm. You know, even if he wasn't organizing a firing party, um, he was aware of the implications. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's what yeah. I, I'm fascinated at times when I see lists for a funeral and he's turned up there yeah, yeah. and kind of going what's the connection yeah because i know th there is a reasoning behind it mm. you know and none mm. of them did these things lightly and they sat down and they thought mm. about it and they calculated mm. it for mm. 
Mm. Well, whatever amount of time they had before a funeral. Yeah. Say, right? yeah. So, um, and as I was saying to you, I think when I first found that list in the National Archives, yeah, it's a brilliant list, I was yeah. fascinated because I'm looking, it, it's the whole of Irish life is there. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. But yeah. what fascinated me was the amount of people who, now I'm by no means as up to speed on somebody like Russell as you are, right? But I was just fascinated by just how many people that I would be aware of wouldn't have been on the same page with Russell. Mm. But they still went and they went respectfully. And I mm. think it's they were still mindful of the fact that a period in time when they were on the same page as Russell, Russell yes. was a very significant figure. Yes, definitely. And I think he's I think he's a figure that we really need to, to reassess. He's somebody mm. we could do with a fairly decent biography of. Yeah. Because I think people steer clear of somebody like Russell, yeah. whereas in reality. There were an awful lot of people, say, from the labor movement who moved into communism, who then started to fl flirt with fascism mm. because they looked at national socialism and national socialism was this incredible yeah. economic miracle in Germany. Yeah. At the same time, you had members of the English royal family and the higher levels of society in Britain mm. looked at national socialism and they were going, who is this Alfred uh, um, uh, Adolf Hitler guy? What yeah, is yeah. Really amazing. Absolutely. And yeah. they all started to flirt with national socialism and everyone yeah. wanted a piece of it because yeah. they had totally transformed German society. Yeah. Now, it then evolved into something else. But we look at the end product. Yes. And we go, how could you do that? Yeah. But yeah. I don't think we necessarily understand the impact that national socialism had in countries, mm. particularly mm. among people who had been involved in movements that had failed, mm. that, it, that mm. had never delivered on the early promise. Yeah. And Germany seemed to be doing that. Yeah, but but it was all that like like even when you talk about like you know the state was neutral during the Second World War. I remember Brian Hanley making this point to me. It was written about the period a lot, lot more and a lot better than me. Like, but mm. Brian said to me, "But you know, you forget sometimes like you know like the early Nazi military victories. That like you know some Irish people that oh great they're giving Britain a black eye. Yeah. Like do you know what I mean? Like I mean there was kind of like a not a you know people are like going through these things at the moment. Like you know as you say we're looking at the end product where." you know, mm. through the Nuremberg trials, we see the full evils of the regime and, you know, associated with it and everything. As Brian even said to me that, like, do you know, when you look at, like, what happened with actual Nazi collaborators in different countries, they didn't meet a very, uh, you know, happy end, you know, helping their Nazi occupiers. Like, you know, it wasn't a, no. wasn't a great situation for a lot of them. Like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of a deep dive and all that at the moment. Like, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, no, it's, <clears throat> yeah, but it's, it's, it's but it's, 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 it's like, appreciating the fact that, like, there were, complex attitudes at the time to what was going on in the international situation i mean you see it now with the pandemic like do you know what i mean like the complexity of the time like i'm sure there'll be a fixed narrative of the pandemic 10 20 years from now but like you know people are thinking different things and different attitudes to different events and developments and that's the same as it was during the second world war you know it's, it's a lot of nazis were in key roles within culture yeah. in dublin yeah. in the lead into the second world war yeah. And I'm talking to people like Colonel Fritz Brassi, yeah, yeah. head of the army band, yeah. uh, ran the army school of music. Yeah. Everyone in Dublin went to his concerts in the Phoenix yeah. Park. Thousands yeah. of people went to see them. He yeah. was like a major celebrity, right? He was one of the top, at the very top of the list of members of the Nazi party yeah. signed on with the German legation in Dublin. But you had people like Adolf Maher in the National Museum. There were... You know, there were so many areas of Irish culture yeah. where rallying points were Germans who were members of the Nazi party. Yeah. You know, definitely, and definitely. we had a slightly different take on Germany at the start of the war. Yeah. To the end. Yeah. You know, and I'm getting yeah. off my soapbox now. Yeah, but, that, that's the, but that's the thing, like, you know, it's like, it's such a major complex subject. Like, like even writing the talk, I'm like, because I, I just thought I had to have a slide maybe contextualizing it a bit, but like even I'm going like, God, you could really you could do like a series on this. Like, you know, not even like one talk talking about all that at the time. Like, you know, but like, I mean, I, I just think, I mean, 
I mean, I think it's like I, I do think that Russell was not. He was, it was just he was just purely out for the be it the financial support and the armaments. I can that's very clear to me from what I look at. I mean, we can debate them. Or I, I think it's I think it's right though. I like to debate the morality of that association, but that wasn't immediately obvious to the IRA leadership and membership at the time. Like you know, it's just England's difficulties, Ireland's opportunity. Mm. You know, we can criticize how why is that you, you know, like sometimes the enemy of your enemy, sorry, the, the enemy, the enemy of your enemy is not a friend, it's just another enemy sometimes. Like, like the, that, that that doesn't always seem so obvious in the moment. Like it's 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 the danger of reading history backwards, I think. You know, mm. you, you do you do get that a lot. Like even but you know, but like, I know, I, I know another comment you made about like you know that it does need to be a major study of Sean Russell done at some. But I would be interested in myself in doing that. I want to get you to do the book on Lee Lynch first. But I, I do, I do see a lot of commonalities in Lynch and Russell in the respect of that, like you know, there's complexities and ambiguities in their character that haven't really been brought out because no one's really brought all the material together. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not criticizing other better historians than me like you know this time and other interests that can divert you away from that like but like I, I do see a lot of similarity in the two of them in terms of how they've been depicted and understood and contextualized within their time like do you know what I mean um and appreciating you know they had they had great extraordinary positive attributes but you know they, they, they're flaws as well and they were human and they made mistakes and they made poor decisions like so you know it's I, I, I don't know why I'm drawn to these militant figures to understand it, but I am like and I, I, I do quite enjoy it so I, I hope I hope my uh, my talk on Russell was, was illuminating in that sense. We, we have a comment from Manus now if you want to come up and Yeah, it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, in the uh, uh, in the 1970s there were two sets of commemorations of Sean Russell, yes. one by prov provisional Sinn Féin and the other by official Sinn Féin, wow. and the, the key player in the uh, ceremonies for the monument uh, was Cahill Goulding, uh, uh, chief of staff of, of, of the official IRA, because Goulding was OC of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA at the time of the uh, monuments unveiling. Uh, there were close uh, family uh, connections and neighbor, neighborly connections between the Goulding and the, the, uh, the Russell family. And uh, the, the thing is, the interesting thing is about the splits in the IRA in the Cora and Chairman camp. There, if you read McKeown's um, uh, accounts, uh, there were actually four groupings. Uh, one was pro-Nazi uh, led by uh, Jim Donovan one was Russellite and definitely not Nazi, but purely militaristic, led by mm -hmm. uh, Lacey. And, uh, the, uh, and uh, Carl Goulding was a member of that group. Then there was the Sean McCool group, uh, which was pro-socialist, but believed in uh, tactical uh, uh, assistance uh, from uh, the Germans. And then there was the communist Connolly group, and uh, with that involved my father and uh, Neil Gould. And in fact, because of my, my father's activities, my, the uh, Russellite group, uh, in his absence from the hut, that they were in separate huts, but the Russellite Russell, Russell group actually held a court martial of my father and sentenced him to death. Now, obviously, it wasn't carried out since I was born in 1949. <laughs> but um, uh, I have had occasion to... Uh, defend uh, Russell's integrity uh, uh, with two uh, now disgraced journalists, Kevin Myers and Owen Harris. I think I read one, I think, I think I read one of those letters actually. Yeah. Once, uh, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, the key thing about Russell is he was a pure militarist. Uh, the other interesting thing about him is that uh, both the war criminal, Weissmeyer, who was uh, sentenced at a later Nuremberg trial, and Lahousen, who gave evidence uh, against uh, von Ribbentrop uh, for the prosecution at Nuremberg, both of them said Ryan and Russell quarreled. And it's quite clear they would have, uh, have quarreled because yeah. uh, Ryan was dead against the bombing campaign, uh, as testified by his fellow prisoner in Spain, uh, Tom Jones, <laughs> uh, even to the point of Tom Jones suggesting that uh, 
<laughs> Ryan was willing to give information to the British authorities about uh, who was involved in the campaign. I, I, I would take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. But it's interesting that um, people who accuse Ryan, wrongly accuse Ryan of being a German collaborator, never deal with the evidence that he might have been a British collaborator in relation to the, the bombing campaign. But the other interesting thing about the bombing campaign is that uh, I, I've published a, a correspondence. My, my, my uh, sorry, I, I've published uh, s- uh, something from the diary of Desmond Greaves of the Connolly Association, who visited Cork in 1939 and spoke to two IRA veterans of the Spanish War, my father and Jim Regan, and they were both opposed to the the bombing campaign. Thought it was very destructive. Nonetheless, Regan, being a loyal. IRA volunteer uh, went uh, to England, participated in the campaign and had uh, suffered years of of terrible imprisonment as a result of that. So that's an indication of different uh, responses to who do you follow as a leader? Uh, ultimately, uh, Jim Regan followed Russell as the then uh, chief of staff, even though he and participated in the campaign that he was actually against. So that's part of the enigmas, that were some of the enigmas of, 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 of loyalty and commitment. That's really that's, that's, that's really interesting. Thanks very much for that, uh, Manus. And it's, it's fascinating though. Like I mean, like that that persists a lot. Like I mean, it's funny. Um, like the rumors of uh, Ryan assassinating Russell do endure for quite a long time. Even that are that that series I quote in Reynolds News that Dermot Brennan wrote. It's a brilliant series about Russell, but he ends with saying like, "Oh, Ryan probably had something to do with it." Like, and it's the only part of the thing where I'm like, "No, oh, like that's that's ridiculous. Like, there's no way he was part of it." Like, the, like I mean, I think that it's brilliant that we have that private correspondence with Leopold Kearney because without that, I, I don't think you can't like you wouldn't be able to outright say, "Well, you know, we can outright say Ryan had nothing to do with it." You know. Okay, have we any more questions from anybody? Are you raising your hand or putting your glasses on, Hugo? Glasses on. <laughs> um, so, well, if we've no more questions, maybe we'll wrap it up um, here um, so people can log out if they want to. Um,